Hello and welcome to our tutorial on conducting exploratory factor analysis or EFA using Jamovi. We're going to delve into a practical example using the Big Five personality test data and you can find that data set at openpsychometrics.org. First, let's talk about what EFA is and when it's appropriate to use it. An exploratory factor analysis is a statistical method that's used to uncover the underlying structure of a large set of variables. It's particularly useful for identifying groups of interrelated variables. Mathematically, you might say that it will reduce the data dimensionality while retaining as much information as possible. So in our example, we're going to show how to use Jamovi to do an EFA, and we're going to use the Big Five personality test data. And this data is really ideal for EFA because it includes multiple items on a survey that were designed to measure broad domains of personality, but they might be interrelated and form distinct factors, like maybe some of the survey items are related to how open the person is, or whether they're introvert or extrovert, agreeableness, neuroticism, etc. So the, the items might group and form factors under those concepts. So why would you want to use an EFA? If you're trying to develop a typology or a theoretical framework of underlying factors that describe your data, then EFA would help you see what factors are correlated with each other and how you might group the items. So this is especially valuable if you're starting with without a predetermined idea of what the structure is. I read the data in by clicking up here in the top left and I went to open and then I browsed until I found where the data was and read it in. I've got a key here of what the variables are, what the survey questions were, and I'm going to just show you if you're the type of person who you want to label in Jamovi what the questions are, show you how to do that. So the E1 is I am the life of a party, and let's go back to Jamovi. I'll copy that. And when you click on E1 setup, if you want to label it, you can put the question in there and that way you've got it all in one place. You don't have to do that. You just can if you want. And the data got read in as uh, nominal data, but because it's Likert scale, you can leave it that way and it's going to be treated as continuous or you can change it to continuous. But either way, it's going to be treated as continuous. Um, and you need it to be continuous to do this analysis. I'm going to change all of the variables to be continuous and I want to do this all at once. I don't want to do it one at a time because there's too many of them. So just hold down the shift key until you've selected across all of them. Go to setup and now you see it got up here you've got them all selected and we're going to change them all to continuous. So we have 50 items and people could rate from 1 to 5 on a Likert scale. Now we want to go to the Analysis tab here and Factor, click on that and choose Exploratory Factor Analysis. So that brings up this set of menus and whatever we do on the left is going to show up on the right. The right is like our output. And we want to choose just the variables of the survey items. So hold down the shift key and let's choose them all at once. And then hit the arrow to move them over there. These are factor loadings that reflect these default settings. Let's look at the settings here. We have extraction method to choose, minimum residuals, this works well if you're dealing with smaller sample sizes or if your data doesn't strictly meet the assumptions of multivariate normality. It's, uh, it's good for ordinal data because it's less sensitive to the distribution of the variables. We've also got maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood is more statistically rigorous. It assumes the multivariate normality in your data. And this is a good choice if you're going to conduct further statistical tests 
like if you're later going to do a, a CFA, a confirmatory factor analysis, or if you need to compare the fit of different factor models, this one would be recommended. You need to have a large sample size, though, if you're going to use this one. The principal axis factoring is more suitable if you're interested in underlying theories rather than pure data reduction. This method can handle somewhat non-normal data, and it's, it's effective for psychological and social science research where the data may not be perfectly normal. We're going to use the principal axis extraction for this data. Now you need to choose the rotation method. If you choose none, there is no rotation applied, and this can result in factors that are less interpretable, especially if they're correlated, but you would typically use this if you just want to see the raw factor solution. The Veramax rotation is an orthogonal rotation that simplifies the loadings within each factor, aiming to make each factor as independent from the others as possible. So this is best used if you expect that your factors are not correlated with each other. The Quartamax, that's another orthogonal method. This simplifies the loadings across factors and makes it easier to identify items that load highly across multiple factors. This is useful when simplifying items rather than factors is what your priority is. The oblomen that comes from the word oblique, it's an oblique rotation. This allows factors to be correlated. So this method is suitable if you anticipate or want to allow for correlations between your factors. This one is used a lot in psychological or social science research where the factors are not expected to be completely independent. The Promax is an extension of the oblique rotation, starts with an orthogonal solution like Veramax and then allows for the factors to be correlated. It's more efficient computationally and it usually will result in a simpler structure with clearer loadings, especially if the factor correlations are high. The Simplimax aims to simplify the interpretation by maximizing the simplicity of the loading columns and rows. It's a less common choice, but it's kind of a compromise between the Veramax and the Quartamax. I've got social science data here, so let's choose Oblumen for our rotation. Now you have to decide whether you want a parallel analysis or do you want to set the eigenvalues to a specific thing like greater than one. The parallel analysis is the recommended one. It will help you decide how many, how many factors to retain. What it does is it takes your eigenvalues generated from your actual data set and compares them to eigenvalues generated from a random data set of the same size and the same dimensions and then it will graph them for you and the factors whose actual eigenvalues exceed the corresponding eigenvalues from the random data are considered significant and they're the ones that you should retain. So choose a scree plot here in the additional output and it will graph your eigenvalues from your real data against the eigenvalues from the simulation data and the ones that exceed, you can see here we've got seven eigenvalues that exceed what the simulated eigenvalues, and that's how many factors they gave us. Now you've got assumption tests here, and we'll go ahead and check these. The Bartlett's test, this test helps verify that the overall correlations between the variables are strong enough to run a reliable factor analysis. So the significant test results, you want a p-value less than 0.05, would suggest that there are some relationships between these variables, and that justifies the factor analysis. Then we also have the KMO, the Kaiser Meyer Oakland, and this is a measure of sampling adequacy. You want this to generally be 0.6 or higher is considered acceptable. And we have some more choices we can make here. I like to sort the data, just makes it easier to look at. And we can hide loadings smaller than some certain number. And what this does, it simplifies the output, makes it easier to identify and interpret the underlying patterns. We can set the cutoff at 0.4, it's absolute value, so don't worry about your negatives. 
if we cut it like at 0.3 or 0.4, it only displays the loadings that are above this threshold. We can get additional output here. Let's go ahead and get everything. Initial eigenvalues, it will basically give you a table that shows the values that are in your scree plot. So those are essentially these values. We can get a factor summary table. Each row in this table represents a factor identified in the analyses. And then the sum of square loadings, these are the eigenvalues. And the percentage of variance tells us the total variance in the data set that's explained by each factor. And this metric helps understand the weight or the impact of each factor relative to the total data variance. And now to interpret your results, look at your factor loadings, go back to the original items and sort them by which factor they belong to, and identify the items that had the highest absolute loadings, because these items are the most indicative of what that factor represents. And note any patterns or, or common themes among the items that are represented in a single factor. And then based on the items that load highly on each factor, try to conceptualize what that factor might represent. Like, for example, if a factor has high loadings from items that are related to social interaction, you might label this a social skills factor or a teamwork factor. And check if any of the items have significant loadings on more than one factor. Those are called cross loadings, and they might indicate items that are complex and represent more than one dimension, or they suggest an overlap between the factors. And, and then review your theoretical framework, the existing literature that's there that will help you interpret the constructs, and then name your factors. Once you're confident that you have the interpretation, give each factor a descriptive name that captures the essence of that factor. 